fortunate to have Greg Doyle sitting in with us uh, this week from the Indy Star. Of course, you know him as their lead columnist. Uh, had a, a couple of columns out this week of great interest. First was with the regarding the IHSA and quickly want to finish that up. Uh, Greg, how do they continue to get away with this? We we just talked about the board is is set uh, a certain way that that uh, does not really seem to be made up of people who are open minded, um, and yet nothing seems to change at the IHSA level. You know, they say in football coaching, every everything that one team the offense does, the defense should have a counter, and that. The IHSA has a counter for every argument you make, including because I, I asked that and they said, well, these are these board positions are voted on by the membership. And they are. I mean, you, you it's an election. The IHSA in their defense doesn't appoint 18 people, two black men, two white women, 14 white guys. They don't do that. But they're open elections. Anybody can apl- can apply if they want to be voted on. But as I quoted in that story and as I told Nidig, women and minorities have told me they they don't want to run for positions they know they're not welcome to, to win. They don't feel welcome to win. Right or wrong, they don't feel welcome. How does that how do you feel about that, Paul? You know, and so because he was saying, well, do you have people that want to run and don't yeah, I have. I've talked to them. I'm not going to quote them publicly because they don't want to put it as they told me, they don't want to put a target on their back. It's amazing how schools in the in the state are actually afraid of the IHSAA. They're afraid of whether it's fighting too hard for a transfer or trying to get on the executive board if you're if you're not one of the 14 white men, they're afraid of putting, as, as I was told, a target on their back. I have a, a football, and the story I quoted him, didn't name them. There's, I don't know how many class 6A football schools are in the state, but there's 10 ranked in the top 10. One of their head coaches told me, it's in there, in there 100%, we're afraid of the IHSA. That is a ranked class 6A football coach. If, if that's the... If, if that's the mood around your organization, then your organization's broken. You need to make sure that's not the mood because people are afraid to challenge. So wh- why does it get fixed? Everybody's afraid of them. That's why. And, and that is amazing because I, I, I've never met Paul Neidig. I'm, I'm not spoken with him, so I, I, I have no take on him personally. But from afar, it just seems like either he doesn't get it or he does not want to get it. Uh, that uh, he let's just leave it the way it is and uh, this keep this machine rolling. That's how the good old boys club is. Uh, you don't know. Do they not get it or do they not want to get it? It's some combination of two. It's just, it, and I, it goes back to self-awareness. It, it becomes kind of a willing, willing ignorance of you don't really know who you are. And, and even though people are trying, like I'm trying to point it out to you and not just because here's my opinion, but here's what, People around the state are saying, here's what a judge said about your transfer system last year. I quoted that in another story. Here's what um, attorneys are saying about what it's like to go in that room and try and fight for a kid, how overwhelming it is. I mean, here's what people are saying about your your company, but he, he hears what he wants to hear. And what he wants to hear is that his check for about 200 grand a year cashes. I cannot remember the kid that it involved. Uh, it was a football player that uh, I was speaking with Kyle about, Kyle Nedenrip from the Indy Star, um, that was trying to transfer because I think his mom's job had changed and his ride situation, it was making it hard on them. They wouldn't let him, and it, it, it just turned into a complete mess. And it, again, it was like, what are you kidding me here? These are common sense things, man. Uh, this was not a guy, a kid that was just trying to transfer to his schools. So it, it's just, it stinks to see what they do to these kids. And, uh, and I, I hope it does change. And, but that's up to the, the members. Like you said, the NCAA, uh, while Mark Emmert was seemed like a clown and he kind of was, he was also at the behest of, of IU's president, of Purdue's president, of Notre Dame's president, of whomever. They're the ones that put those people in power. Who puts Nidig in power? The it's, it's beautiful. The executive board does. But the executive board, you don't get on that board unless you're afraid of the IHSA in the first place. And then you get put on the board and you got 18 people that are on that board and they know they're on the board because the IHSA let them be on that board. And then as I wrote in the story, there's a, there's a direct line that if you get tired of academia – because it's grueling. We all know being a principal is grueling. Once you get tired of that, 
a safe landing spot is you can go become an IHSA assistant commissioner when you retire from your, your school up the north or wherever. Go make 160 grand a year, which is a fifty thousand dollar raise at the IHSA as an executive committer, uh, executive. I'm sorry, assistant commissioner. And then, like they've had nine commissioners, the IHSA. Seven of them got their start on the executive committee. It's a very, it's a, it's a, it's a conveyor belt that no one wants to jostle. Yeah, it's. Uh, I don't, I don't know why, but it, the name Putin comes to mind <laughs> uh, of how he can maintain power there. Switching uh, gears, you also had a story that came out yesterday, I believe. Was, uh, was that right? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, the 17th. I want to make sure because when I read that regarding Indiana football and not that this is a secret, but Indiana football has really put themselves in a horrific position with where football has gone. Um, one of the things in regarding, you know, if if a, uh, the desire was to move on from Kyle Ballon, they can't because they have put themselves at behind a contract that they can't afford to pay, which uh, the golden rule was always to not give a buyout that you cannot afford. Um, that's a position Indiana is in right now. And that we're about to enter into the new Big Ten, which is just going to exacerbate uh, this situation. Yeah, the irony is that a lot of folks say if IU football would only support, I'm sorry, if the administration would only support the football program at IU, they do. That's why they're in this mess. They supported Paul Allen by get, ma making him at the time the 10th highest paid coach in the country, giving him about the biggest buyout in the country. You know, they they have poured money into the program. It's not, it's, but they've supported it so well that they're now stuck. You know, and when you get a coach, when you're when you're an IU or a Duke or a, a football program, Kentucky, that historically doesn't win football. When you finally have a coach that wins, you keep them. You do what it takes to keep them because if you if you lose them and, and have to hire Kevin Wilson again, you start all over. So that's why Purdue is so aggressive with Jeff Brom. You, you keep that guy as long as you can. Well, IU thought they had that guy in Tom Allen. Now, and 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 I understand. Back at the time, I thought they had the guy too. But you look back now at, at the hindsight, and you and you realize, oh, that was Michael Penix that did that. That's who did, and Kalen DeBoer who put the offense in. They did that. Because now DeBoer and Penix have Washington in the top five. They're doing it up there. That's what they did. And they're gone. And it's kind of like when IU, when when Bruce Arians, I'm sorry, when the Colts, when Bruce Arians replaced Chuck Pagano and, and Pagano had leukemia and it was terrible. Arians replaced him and the Colts took off, started winning. And there was like this Arians effect that lasted for a couple of years until it was gone. And you realized, oh, Arians kind of, Arians is the guy they should have kept. Well, Kalen DeBoer is the guy they should have promoted, you know, and Michael Penix they should have kept. And, but it's hindsight. You don't know. So now they're stuck. And as I wrote, and I didn't take joy in this. I didn't write, Tom Allen needs to be fired. I didn't write that. What I wrote was, Tom Allen's going to be fired. It's just a matter of time. You know, you can all see it. It's it's not, there's not even an argument to be made. I didn't even argue. Like, here's the record. I didn't even, I didn't even put his coaching record in there. There's no argument. He's clearly overmatched. The question is, do you fire him now and spend $20 million, which you don't have, or do you wait a year, fire him next year, it'll cost $8 million, which you don't have either, but still it's less than twenty. You, those are two options. But So how much money do you lose by keeping him this year, one more year? That's the question. You're going to lose money either way. Are you willing to lose whatever you lose, including your stature, your, your momentum, your place in the Big Ten? How far are you willing to sink, in other words, before you go ahead and do the inevitable and fire the guy? It's not just money they're going to lose because I don't know how much money IU football makes outside of the money they get from the Big Ten compared to, say, an Ohio State, Michigan, where who, who's making like $6 million a game. They make more in a single game than IU makes in football all season. But it's not just money. It's players. I, I, I'm wondering how many players they're going to be able to hold on to, valuable players. And they've also lost a ton of coaches uh, assistant coaches throughout this this uh, tenure. It's been a combination of bad hires and refusal to fires for me. Um, for a long time, I thought, I really thought when they replaced uh, Kalen DeBoer with Nick Sheridan, I was like, that is the dumbest thing in the world. That was That position was red hot. You could have hired anybody in the United States and not did what I called the good old boy thing and did that. But looking back, 
I don't know how much it was Nick Sheridan or more importantly, it was Tom Allen's refuse. And I love Tom. He's a great guy. And I hate, I hate saying these things as well. Um, but it was his refusal to fire Darren Hiller, who was an absolutely God awful offensive line coach, which was destroying his football team, but he still would not make that decision until he was forced to and had to pay out of his pocket to do it. There are so many parallels to the Colts because Pagano made bad. Look at all the offense coordinators he hired. They were terrible. Defense coordinators were terrible. And then, you know, that's it. Allen, same way. Pagano had a terrible judgment, not of character necessarily, but just of coaches. He just is good old boys. He knew these guys, so he brought them in. Allen, same thing. Knows guys, brings them in. Knows guys' fathers or sons, brings them in. And he's in this position he's in now. Um, and I, I, I would go into this in the story more in, in detail, but – you wonder about his character judgment when he spent six years alongside Hugh Freeze. And Hugh Freeze is not a guy that you look back on and say, wow, I didn't see that coming. Hugh Freeze is a guy that if you spend 10 minutes listening to him, you can tell that he's not what he says he is. Now, if he's your coach or you're trying to make him your coach and you know he wins games, it's like that self-awareness thing I was talking about. You don't see it. It's like when, when Lane Kiffin was at Tennessee – 10 years ago and was being the biggest horse's ass in the country. And everybody hated him, but Tennessee fans are like, nah, he's our guy. You shut up. We like him. And then he leaves him in the middle of the night for USC. And Tennessee's like, oh, we hate Lane Kiffin. Lane Kiffin. <laughs> this, this, ha this story happens everywhere. If he's your coach, you love him until you don't have to love him anymore. And that's like Tom Allen couldn't even see what Hugh Freeze was and spent six years with him. If he can't see that for six years, how is he going to interview – a coach or even have a coach on staff and bring him in and make him your, I mean, you, you have no judgment at all. It's my point, Tom Allen, none. So go be a defense coordinator for somebody else. Cause that's what he's good at. Go do that. Where all that energy and that rah, rah high school stuff that works as a defense coordinator. That That is the exact template. Go do that. Cause he's good at it and he can make a lot more money than I'll ever make. Go do that. But what's happening at IU is not working. Yeah, if Kevin Wilson wasn't uh, Kevin Wilson uh, and Indiana was able to maintain him as on the offensive side with Tom Allen on the defensive side, this would have been fun to watch, I think, IU football, but that didn't happen. Um, not only that, there uh, uh, if IU happens to get to a bowl game next year, because right now the Big Ten is really weak, uh, it's very top heavy. You've got three teams that are top five, seven teams, and then there's everybody else. And the best of the West sucks. Iowa couldn't score. Uh, if you sit them down Broadway with a pocket full of hundred dollar bills, man, but that's going to be the best. If I, you and, and Justin Fuentes and Rod Carey somehow, gets this team to a bowl this year or next, which I don't see it happening this year, especially, but that extends his Tom Allen's contract automatically. Well, I, this is something I actually wrote a few weeks ago when they, they played out their best game of the year was that loss to Louisville, especially when you look at where Louisville was undefeated until last week. I mean, they, they hung tough with Louisville and, and that was the, at that moment, in that moment in time, even with their losing record, you thought, or two and one, whatever they were, you thought, well, they, they might have something here. And Taven Jackson looked good that day. And so that day I wrote, you know, Taven Jackson looks good. You know, he's the closest thing they have, they've had to Michael Penix since Penix left. Because Lord knows Tuttle wasn't, Bazelak wasn't, Grant, Grant Gellum or whatever. I mean, they had a bunch of guys at quarterback, Donovan McCauley, none of them. But Taven Jackson looks like he could be something like that. And so as I wrote back then, but are we going to be in the same position in three years? Is Taven Jackson going to win so much that Tom Allen gets to stay for three more years? And then when they lose Taven, they realize, oh, yeah, that's right. He's, he's not very good. It's just a matter of who is his quarterback. If his quarterback is great, Tom Allen can win. If his quarterback's not great, he's not beating anybody. So I don't know if they're going to – I mean, if Taven Jackson becomes great next year, it's almost – it's a great thing for him. But it's it's – it's going to be a self-fulfilling prophecy for IU if that happens. I don't see it happening. In fact, I don't know if Taven will stay, although you only get one free transfer now in the transfer portal. You mentioned earlier about players leaving. IU had 23 players this year in the portal, and so their portal ranking is high because they've got just the volume. They Oh, they're highly ranked. they got 23 guys. 
That's also a problem. What that means is you had 23 openings. You know you don't have talent on your roster. You better go get it from somewhere else. It's going to be the same thing next year. Is that they're going to they're not recruiting very well. So let's go get someone else's players. Well, there's a reason most of those players are leaving. They're not very good. So it's it's just a cycle. It's a vicious cycle.